Welcome to John Gets Games. Today, I'll be doing a full three-player playthrough of Gentis. In this game, players will take on the role of ancient Eastern Mediterranean civilizations as they try to expand out with their cities, increase their trained populace, and of course, build massive monuments and buildings within these cities to get them the most victory points. I will explain how the game plays while we're actually playing it, so let's jump in. Here we have our board set up and ready for our three-player game. And it might look like there is quite a bit going on here, but when you distill it down, Gentis is all about uh, playing cards. Uh, it does have a big board, but it's very much a card game. And there are four different action uh, spots out here on the board that you can choose from for your main actions on your turn. And you'll notice that each one of these zones has these tokens that are just laying down on their spots. And realistically, this purple zone allows you to gather new cards. This orange zone allows you to play the cards that you already have in your hand. This blue zone up here allows you to build buildings, which will get us resources, which will allow us to uh, gather more cards and play more cards. And lastly, up here, we have this teal zone, which is where we can get new people into our civilization. When we come down here, we can now see the three different player areas. Uh, we are going to be playing from the perspective of the white civilization here. And on the board, you can actually see this tracker zone here, which shows us which uh, number of the various types of people we have in our civilization. Uh, over here, we have nobles. We also have soldiers, priests. This is artisans, merchants, and then finally scholars. And on this track, you can see you can have uh, from zero to six of each of these, but you uh, track them on the same one. So you can never have more than six total within a given line. And at the beginning of the game, we decided to go ahead and start with one, two, three of these priests and one of these nobles. And uh, each one of the players is allowed to generate four uh, people of their choice into their area. And the reason we're doing this is because the people are a requirement for actually playing the cards. And at the beginning of the game, we did a little draft where we got these two cards and our opponents got these over here. And when we look at the anatomy of a card, you'll see this zone down here, which shows the requirements. So you can see right here that both of the cards that we were able to draft require priests. This one requires two, this one requires three, and then this card needs one uh, noble, and this one needs one merchant. So what I decided to do before uh, the camera started rolling is to go ahead and get a noble instead of a merchant, and now we could go into our first turn. So realistically, uh, there's a couple things we could do. The first is we have the requirements we need to just play this card. As I showed before, we have three priests and one noble, and this only requires two and one. So we could take our action to play this card out, which will give us a nice ability, and I'll explain that in a minute. But the other option we have available to ourselves is we could gather more people so that we can get the requirement for this card done as well because there's nothing our opponents can do to reduce the population of our civilization. And right now, all we need in order to make uh, this card's prerequisites work is one merchant, and currently we have zero. The reason I'm thinking this might be a good idea is because when we come back up here and look to this philosopher section where we can train these new people, we can notice that the merchant is all the way over here, almost to the cheapest location on this track, and these were randomly put out. And whenever somebody uh, trains a new person, they slide over to the end and they become much more expensive. So uh, considering we are the starting player, and we know that because we have this pawn right in front of us, I think for our first action, let's go ahead and train some new people. So the way this works is in a three-player game, we have three of these tokens, and we're going to take one of these tokens and then evaluate it. Now, you'll notice that all three of them have a single hourglass on the side, which means it's going to cost one time in order to do these, but then there is a different cost in the circle in the top left. We have four, six, and eight. And if we look along the top, you'll see a similar set of costs. And what that means is if we were to take this one right here, that would be uh, eight money that we'd have to spend. But then if we look to this track, we see the eight right here is in the uh, two section. That means we could train two out of any of the six uh, uh, people on this track. Instead, if we were to take the four, if you'll notice here, we could uh, trace this four back to the one section. So we could take one from this whole area, or we could track this four and take two from just these two right here. And considering we really would like at least one merchant, I think this is a pretty good first turn for us because uh, money is pretty much the only currency in the game. Everybody starts with 20 of it. So let's go ahead and take this token. And when we spend the four, we're going to be able to take soldiers or merchants. We can either take two of one of them or one and one. When we come back to our civilization, it's now time to take this token and put it down onto our action line. And this is a uh, set number of actions that we're going to be able to do on the turn. And since this tile had a single hourglass, that means we're going to take a, another one of these tokens from the supply and put it right here. 
The reason we already have one on our area is because that's just part of setup. You always start the game with one of these on here. And now if you'll notice, we only have four of these slots left over for uh, more actions in this round. Once we have filled out all of these spots, then we will have to pass. So uh, we're definitely going to consider that for our future turns. But for now, we want to pay the four money on this tile. So we spend the five and bring one back. And now we can get to training. So we know that it can be two soldiers, uh, two merchants, or one and one. And if we look out here to the card row, these are all the cards that we can potentially buy on future actions. And if we look to their requirements, we can see that there is this one requires two merchants. This one also requires two merchants. And then one merchant over here. When it comes to soldiers, there's a three, one, one, two, and that's it for that one as well. So realistically, when we look at the cards in our hand, we know that this one, once it gets played, gives us a permanent uh, virtual merchant, which can be used for um, the requirements for future cards. So I figure, uh, since we don't have a solid plan, let's go ahead and do one merchant and one soldier just to leave ourselves flexible. The last thing that we have to do on our turn is update the philosopher area. So all of the ones that got purchased are now going to slide to the end. And if you do multiple different types, the one that was more expensive is going to be the first one to slide over here. And then this one's going to go just like that. And now you can see why I wanted to do this for my first action, because now getting that one merchant is significantly more expensive. I guess you could do it with just the four, but uh, we did it quite efficiently gathering a uh, soldier as well. Play now goes clockwise to the next player, which happens to be green, and they've decided to start things off by actually playing a card that they started with in their hand. So if we look over here, there are seven of these tokens in a given round. Uh, with four players, you would have two more tokens out, but in the three-player game, these are the options available, and you see that the three top ones are actually uh, zero money, but two time, and then down here, we have some one-time ones that cost some money. And at this point in the game, the green player uh, prioritizes time a little bit more than money. So they're going to grab this tile here, which is going to cost them two money. So this tile is going to come down into their area, and it does have an hourglass on it. So they're going to have to add another one onto their action line. They're going to have to spend their two money to actually evaluate the, uh, the action. And then they're going to get to play this card. We see that it requires three scholars and one artisan, which is how they set up their first four. So this is able to be played. It matches all of the requirements. And now a few things happen over here on the right. The first is they're just going to generate two victory points, which is nice for them. Next is, as a bonus, this card is going to make a soldier. So this gets trained immediately. And now for the rest of the game, you see this little infinity symbol. This says that whenever they do a philosopher training action, they always train one more from the set that they can. So uh, this is a very powerful ability, and it makes them much more efficient when they do those trainings. But there is one last thing to evaluate on this card, and that is these symbols in the top right. There are four of these spots, and this card in particular has two of them. And the way this works is when you put this down, you then choose one of the symbols on the card you just played, and then you get one victory point for every one of that symbol that you have in all of the cards that you've played at this point. So this is the first card they've played. It doesn't really matter. They'll just choose the wave at the top, so that'll be one point for that, and then two more points for the card itself. If it wasn't obvious already, this is a victory point style game where whoever has the most points at the end of the game is going to be the winner. And with this first turn, the green player has generated three points by playing that card. At this point, it's now time for the blue player's first turn, and they've decided they want to do a navigation action. So if we look up here, there are seven of these tokens as well. And just like the uh, playing card action, they have a choice of not spending money, but spending more time or spending some money and a little bit less time. But as you can see, navigating is a very timely uh, thing. It's uh, not a quick thing to evaluate. And they've decided they like the idea of getting a trade city built up. So they're going to go ahead and take this token, which is going to cost them four money and then two extra time tokens. So this action marker is going to go down just like that. And now they have an option because all of these uh, tiles have a double hourglass side as well. So instead of putting two of these singles down, they could do just a double. But you are essentially pushing things off into the future because at the end of every round, you are going to remove all of your single hourglasses and flip over all of your doubles. So that means they're either going to pay two actions in this round or one action in this round and one in this next. And they decide they're actually okay with doing two of their actions right now. So they'll put both of those down. They, of course, have to spend their four money. And now they get to found that city specifically in a trade area. 
when they look out to the board, they find several different spots they could put this building into. Now, it must match the trading goods icon on the map, but uh, they don't have to necessarily send it to these far-flung places. They can also do a hometown building in one of these three slots right here, and these will give them uh, some in-game benefits that let them uh, give them uh, new uh, optional things they could do or maybe modify some of the other actions that they already would have done. But they've decided to go out here to the main map because whenever you build a hometown area, you get to choose one of the three map areas and activate all of the buildings in that area. So if we did that, we would activate a map and have nothing to actually get for it. So I think they uh, actually want to get a little bit of infrastructure going first, and they've decided to put this down right over here. So whenever you build out onto the map, it's uh, similar to this in that you put this down right here, and then you immediately activate all of your buildings within that given region. So right now the blue player only has this one building and the bonus as you can see is just going to generate them two victory points. The other options that are out here are potentially getting some money or putting cubes down on their uh, temples as well as their oracle spots and I'll explain how those work soon but uh, right now the blue player goes right here and then generates two points. And this brings them up to two total. With that done, play now comes back to us and we can take our second turn. So we did a little bit of setup on our first turn going to the Philosopher. I think this time we should go to the Scribe and get at least one of our two cards built uh, now that we can do either of them. And so let's talk about what the bonuses give us. This one over here is pretty simple. Uh, it is going to generate one artisan immediately, and for the rest of the game, we will have one virtual merchant. Uh, so no matter where this token is, we would always have one available to ourselves. But then this one over here, it doesn't give us any new uh, trainings, but you see the sun right here? Well, we're currently in the heyday phase of the round, and that is marked by the sun, which means this gives us a new action option when we're in this action phase of each one of the rounds in the game. And if you look down here, you see it says 1x, and then it has the teal surroundings of the philosopher action. So this means that you can do a philosopher action, it only costs two money and one time, and that is going to restrict the uh, placement uh, uh, out on the uh, philosopher track, like specifically what we can grab. But the really key part of this is you don't actually put a token down on here uh, for the philosopher action, you just do it for the time. So that means we could activate this later on and just put a single hourglass down, which makes us much more efficient, even though, again, we're not quite as flexible about picking the specific uh, trainings that we want to do. And when we look at our board, we see that we have four slots left over. So we could hypothetically just try to get both of these cards built on this turn, or we could build this one right here and then potentially do another philosopher uh, training action later on in the turn. If that maybe makes more sense, or perhaps we'll be purchasing another card for our next action. I think either way, the thing that makes the most sense is to get this down because it's a really nice option that uh, gives us uh, uh, some extra flexibility. So let's go ahead and do a scribe action. We have to pick one of these tiles in order to evaluate this, and I think that it really would be nice not to have to spend it two time at this point. So let's do the cheapest one time one, which will cost us three money. So we go ahead and add those tiles onto our track. We, of course, spend our money bringing us down to 13 total, and now we can play this card because we do have at least two of these priests and at least one of the nobles. So that will go right there. We can activate either of these um, uh, symbol I options. It doesn't really matter. So that's going to be one point plus one over there. And uh, on future turns, maybe we will evaluate this spot right here, uh, certainly in later parts of the game, but perhaps in this specific age itself. But uh, for now, let's get our two points. And that's going to tie us up with blue. It's now the green player's turn, and they've decided they'd like to do a navigation option, uh, just like the blue player did. And they have a few different uh, options right here. Of course, this one was removed by the blue player, and I didn't mention this down here. This is a wild symbol, so it could be the uh, temple, the oracle, or a trade house area. But in this case, the green player decides they're okay with spending a little bit of money and a little bit less time in order to take this oracle spot right here. And when they add it to the board, they can do a double token or two singles. And in this case, they just had to go with the double token. So they're essentially spending one of next turn's actions in order to have an extra slot open this turn. And that will cost them four of their money. And now they can place one of these buildings out onto an Oracle location. When they come out to the map, they find a bunch of different options for themselves, but they've decided to go up here to Delphi, and once they place down here, they activate all of their buildings in the red region, which is just Delphi, so this is going to generate one cube for them in the Oracle location. This means that when they come back to the board, they'll put it down right over here because that matches the Oracle symbol. If they had built in a temple, they would have put a cube down over here. And so you can see these cubes act as a variety of different things. Uh, these up here are unlockable to give the players more actions. But specifically, when you have a cube over here, they now have a new option. 
you can see down here as a free action, they can spend the cube and they can shift around two of their trained population. So that means they could reduce uh, two of the uh, specific people in order to bump two others. And it could be the same one or split as much as they want to. So they're going to keep this in their back pocket. Also, at any point in time, you can spend three cubes, uh, mix and match between your oracles and your temples in order to simply permanently train one person. So having this around is pretty nice for them considering they did not play this other card in their hand. So it's uh, odds are very good that they don't have the requirements set up to actually meet it right now. With Green's turn done, it's now the blue player's turn, and they've decided to grab the last of the single hourglass action locations, so the blue player now gets to play their first card of the game. They, of course, pay their time cost as well as their money cost, bringing them down to just 11, and now they're going to play this card right here. Uh, if you look at the requirements, it is one noble, one merchant, and one scholar, and they definitely have that down here, and it's going to generate them one point, but down here we see a very powerful ability. It says for the rest of the game, whenever they do a taxation action, they will take twice as much money. And there are a couple of these bonuses spread throughout the game with cards and even a hometown spot on the board. And these all stack. So this is going to go right over here into the area. They will activate one of these top two symbols. So that's going to be one plus one or two points for playing the card down. This puts blue in the lead at four points, and if you'll notice over here, this is the taxation area. It doesn't actually have a tile, and it simply means that you can spend one time to take four money, or two time at any point to take eight money. So the blue player is poised to take a big time advantage of this uh, with their 2x modifier. That means for one time, they actually get eight money now, and it's uh, odds are good they'll be doing this a few times throughout the game. Okay, it's once again our turn, and unfortunately, at this point, we only have the two action locations left over, and while we could actually play this card, we have the requirements met, well, um, all of the single-time uh, scribe spots have been taken, so all the future ones are the tile plus two, which is three spots, and we just can't fit that in, so there's no way to get this card built on this turn, so instead, we need to think about some other options. We could do taxation, like I just showed, in order to uh, get some more money. Right now, we're at 13. But another thing we could do is we could get new cards from this card row. And I think that's probably what we're going to want to do for our turn. And the way this works is somewhat similar to the Philosopher in that uh, based off of the money that you spend on the token you take, you will be able to take uh, maybe one card from really far out or multiple cards from far down. So I think let's go ahead and grab this token right here. We see it's going to cost us six money and one time. So that's going to go right here. And this is obviously the last action that we're taking in this round. We have to spend the six money, so that means that, unfortunately, we are now down to seven total, so we're probably going to have to do something about that in the next round of the game. And now we can purchase a card. And if you look at the various uh, icons up here, we did six money, which means we could grab all three of these first cards right over here. Or if we find the next six, it's right over here, we could grab one card from this set right here, and then, oh, I missed this one right here. Uh, from this location on, we could take two out of these four total. Uh, but specifically, the one that we really want is this shrine over here. Uh, first of all, it gives three points, which is nice. It has the little circle with the line under it, which matches all of the cards we've played so far, so it synergizes well for points. But down here, this bonus is you get to permanently remove one of these, which gives you an extra action slot for the rest of the game. And I think that is a very powerful thing for us to try and uh, get going, specifically on the second round of the game. There's going to be six rounds total. So I think that's something to work uh, towards, especially considering we already have the noble, the soldier, and the priest. We don't have an artisan just yet, but when we get this card built, it's going to make an artisan, which means on the next turn, we could hypothetically build this card for our first turn, and then build this card for our second turn, and then probably be completely out of money, but uh, have some extra action slots, and I think that's a reasonable plan. So we're just going to go ahead and take this, and uh, at this point, you might be saying, but wait a minute, isn't getting three cards for six money a lot better than getting one card, even if it's a really good card? And you might be right, but there is an interesting penalty in this game. After each one of the rounds, each player is going to be penalized for any card over three that they have in their hand. So if I took all three of those, I would be at four cards, I'd be at one over, and for every card over that, you start the round with an extra hourglass on your spot. So you get punished for being inefficient, so uh, that is yet another reason to take the specific card we want as opposed to just grabbing a bunch of stuff and hoping to play it later. This action is finished out by sliding everything down and resupplying the row, and now the green player can go. After looking over all their options, they decide to do something new, and that is to take this token right here. 
There's only one of them in the game, and it's the only action uh, token that does not require a time marker. And what it means is they will actually be the start player in the next round, and they will immediately generate two money. So they go ahead and put the token right here and generate their two money, and they only have one slot left, which is probably going to be just generating more money for themselves because there's not that many single action spot actions in the game. Speaking of one action slot, it's now the blue player's turn, and they have decided to do a taxation action for just one hourglass, getting them four money as a base. But of course, the special bonus of their well is going to double that, so they'll put this down right here and generate... Eight more money, bringing them up to 20, which is a pretty good place to be for the start of the next round of the game. Play now comes back up to us, but we have no more action slots, so we have to pass. So the green player now goes with only one location uh, available to themselves. They are going to do a taxation that is going to generate four money for themselves. And now we see the blue player is done. Uh, we are done. And the green player is now done once they put their hourglass in for that taxation. So with that, the heyday phase is now over. And that means that it's now time to go into the decline phase. And this is kind of a uh, setup phase to a certain extent. It has several different uh, steps to it. And the first one is we determine the new starting player. That's going to be the person who took this tile. If nobody took it, then the starting player wouldn't actually move. But in this case, it does go down here to the green player. Next up, each player is going to clean off their time track. So as I mentioned before, all of the single hourglasses are going to go away. And then all of the actions are going to go back out onto the board. But any player that has one of these double hourglasses is going to flip that over. And it's going to start the uh, turn off over there on their board for the next round. Next, we're going to push the round token up once. We see that there are two rounds for each of the eras in the game. And when you go from uh, the uh, one era to the next, everybody actually removes one of the tokens from the board, uh, just like this ability does, so that we will all have more actions as the game goes on, although this gives us an additional leg up. But for now, we did not actually change the era. It's just the second round of the first era. The next step of the decline phase involves the buildings that players have put out on the map. Specifically, each player gets to activate one building from each of these three colored regions. So that means that the green player gets to activate, uh, well, this one from the red area, getting themselves another cube onto their oracle spot, and the blue player activates this one to get two more points. And this is definitely a region to spread out between the regions because you activate one per region at the end of each phase. But of course, when you place a new building down, you activate everything within a region. So you have a push and pull there. And maybe we are kind of regretting not actually getting a building put down in the first round. But either way, our opponents both get their rewards. This brings blue up to six points. And green gets their second oracle cube. Next up, if any of the players had a played card that gave a bonus in the decline phase, like this card right here with the moon, then they would evaluate that. But nobody has any of those just yet. And we are going to finish this off by checking our hand limits. Everybody has three or less cards, so no penalties are given out for that. And we can now move into the next heyday phase, in this case for the second round of the game. Since the green player has a starting player token, that means they get to go first, and they're going to start things off with a scribe action, getting some new cards for their hand. This right here says it's going to cost six money and one hourglass, so that'll go right there, as will this. And next up, for six money, they can take all three of these, or two out of the first four, or just one out of the first six, and they definitely want this card right here. Uh, and the next one they're going to grab is going to be this one right here. Uh, the, uh, if you look over here, you'll notice that this requires an oracle building built, and the green player has done that already. But uh, if you notice here, it has a symbol that does not actually match the symbols of the cards that they've already played. Specifically, they like this little star symbol right there. So uh, with that, they could take this card as well, but they don't feel a need to have two of the same bonus down here. You'll notice that it is a heyday bonus that lets them do uh, additional scribe actions for the four money cost, and it's obviously more time efficient for themselves. They don't want two of those kind of clogging up their hand, so they're just going to grab these two, and then everything else is going to slide down. Next up, we have the blue player, and they've decided to do this chronicler action, and they're going to do the cheapest of the single hourglass options. We see on the tile that this is only going to cost them two money. And they can now play a card. They only have one in their hand. And if we look at it right here, we see that they need to have at least one noble. They need two of the artisans, which they have, and then one scholar, which they also have. And as I mentioned before, some of these have building requirements. In this case, they just need to have a temple or oracle or a trade house building built. And they did the trade house building on the last turn. So they're going to go ahead and build this one. It's going to generate them three points. It also makes an artisan right away. And in the decline phase for the rest of the game, they have this new option where they can spend three money in order to take uh, one victory point 
point, and they can do that up to five times in each of the decline phases. So they can now slide this in just like that because the requirements don't terribly matter, and they will get three points, plus they will activate, well, either of these realistically because they match. So they'll do the little waves, so that's one, two, plus three, or five points. They were at six, so now they are all the way up at 11. The blue player is certainly doing a good run here on the points in the early game. It's now time for us to take our first turn of the game, and we've kind of set our turns up already. There's not a whole lot to think about. We really want to get both of these cards played, uh, obviously this one first, so that it will help pay for this one. And that means we should do that for our first and second action to get this done as cheaply as possible. So let's go ahead and look at the Chronicle options. And with only seven money to our name, we have a decision to make here because, well, we could just do this for zero money. It would cost us an additional time, so three uh, time slots total. And right now we have seven time slots available on our board. So that would be almost half of them just to get one of these down. Or we could do this for two time slots and three of our money. And I think let's go ahead and do that. And maybe for the second card, we'll do one of the free ones so that we don't uh, completely run out of money. Also, there's a possibility that one of our opponents takes this one and these zero cost ones will be our only option. But for now, let's go ahead and spend the money and uh, keep the time in reserve. Uh, that one extra time could always be used as a taxation, which gives us four money back. So I think that, that is definitely worth the three money that we're spending right now. So we go ahead and add these to our board. We pay the money, so we're down to just four. And let's go ahead and get this one built. We have the three priests. We also have the one merchant. So that is going to get us two points. Also, when we slide this under here, uh, we also have the option of uh, either the uh, of these two because they match up. So we'll do the circle with a line. So that'll be two plus one, two, or four points total. Also, we generate an artisan when we do this. And for the rest of the game, we have to remember that we have a virtual uh, merchant uh, always available for us uh, to us for the sake of actually getting more cards built. We were at two points, so now we're up to six. Before the green player takes their main action, they want to do two of their oracle special actions. And if you remember, you can remove this cube in order to reduce uh, by one uh, two of the people in their area and then bump up by one two of those people. So in this case, they could go ahead and move the soldier down once and this uh, the scholar down once and then go one, two with their merchants. And then they will remove this one, removing both of their last scholars and turning them into merchants as well. Now for their main action, they're going to grab the last of the single hourglass chronicler tiles and use it to play one of their cards. Now this was the four money tile, so they will go ahead and spend that, bringing them down to five. And now they can play this card right here because of those oracle actions kind of shifting everything around. We see that it requires one artisan, which they have, and then at least three of the merchants. They actually have four now, but the reason they went one above is because the ability on this card will generate them two money for each of their merchants uh, in the decline phase of every turn. So they are definitely motivated to have lots of these merchants right now with four of them. That is uh, eight free money at the end of the round. Uh, this card does give zero bonus points, which is a bit of a bummer, but they are going to then activate the star power on this card. There are one, two of them total in their area, so that's going to be two points for them, which brings them from three up to five. At this point, it's now the blue player's turn, and they've decided to come up here and do a navigation action again. In this case, they're going to take this one right up here, which is going to cost them two time tokens and four money. When they put it down, they decide to go with the double hourglass side of this one right here. That is going to cost them four of their money, but they have quite a bit of money still, and now they get to build one of these buildings onto a temple site. As I mentioned before, these buildings can go down onto the map or over here into the hometown area. And in this case, the blue player decides they want to go right here. That matches the temple symbol. And the reason for that is because this building now gets them access to these two abilities once per heyday phase. Now, this one is just like what the green player has. They can go ahead and activate this building later on when they're doing a philosopher action to get one extra person or this one right here looks just like the card they have in their hand if they uh, were to use this, which they always have it in use, and then activate this right here for a 2x. That means that they could get uh, 4 times 2 times 2 or uh, 16 money, or they could do 8 times 2 times 2 or 34 money for 2 actions. So this allows them to get a ton of money on future taxations, and they're definitely down with that plan. Also, if you notice right up here, when you build a building into a hometown, you then get to choose one of the three regions, and then you activate all of the buildings in that region. In this case, blue currently only has one building over here, so they obviously activate green, getting themselves two more points. They've already squeezed six points out of this building right here. That's pretty good for them. They were at 11, and now they're at 13. 
Okay, it's once again our turn, and I think we want to continue on with our plan of trying to get this card built out now that we have the requirements met. Let's see, we definitely have the priest, we have the soldier, and the noble, as well as the artisan. In fact, we have one of everything except for the scholar, so a uh, pretty uh, versatile population right here. When it comes to our chronicler options, we can either pay zero money and two time, or one money and two time, so I think this is pretty obvious. And when we put this token down, I think let's go ahead and do the double hourglass side. That will leave us with one, two, three openings, plus another one considering we're about to kick out one of these cubes. So four openings is rather nice for this turn. It does mean that next turn we'll have one less action, but I think uh, more stuff now is probably good considering how little money we have. We can maybe try to do some taxation actions and try to set ourselves up better for next turn. So we go ahead and put that down, we spend zero money, and we can go ahead and play the shrine. So we can slide this in just like that. We will immediately kick out this cube and we can slide everything down. So we have a lot of uh, action space available to us left over. And this is a three point card. And if we look over here, we will definitely activate the uh, circle slash right here. We have one, two, three of them already. So that's gonna be three plus three or six points for playing this card. Well, that actually doubles our score because we were at six and now we're all the way up here at 12 right next to the blue player. It's now the green player's turn and they've decided to do a philosopher action and they're actually going to do the expensive one. They're going to spend eight money and uh, one time and that gives them access to all six of the training options and specifically they get to grab two and they're going to go ahead and activate the merchant as well as the priest down here getting one on each. So they of course have to pay for this which is going to bring them down to just two money and now they're going to go ahead and grab that one merchant as well as the one priest and if you remember they have this uh, scriptorium down here which gives them an ongoing bonus of whenever they do a philosophy action they get to gather or uh, train one more uh, person from the associated area depending on how much money they spent so in this case they're going to take one more of these merchants which is going to max them out at six uh, as i mentioned before you can never have uh, more than six uh, evenly split between the two in a row. So that means we have uh, six merchants and zero soldiers. And in the future, if they do gather a soldier, then simply it's going to push this down, uh, getting rid of one of the merchants to counteract that. But right now, the uh, green player feels pretty good about going crazy on this because with six of these, that's going to be 12 money uh, for free during the decline phase. So they're trying to set themselves up uh, for a good turn on the next turn. So with that, they are now done with their philosopher action. And we, of course, have to reset this over here. So these are going to slide down, and the more expensive one goes in first. And then we are ready for the blue player's turn. They've decided to come over to the scribe area, and they're going to pick up the single action eight money option. This leaves them with just one spot left over, and also six money left over, although it seems like they're in pretty good hands as far as making money is concerned. And they now get to draw cards. They currently have no cards in their hand. And with eight money, that means they can take two cards from here or down, or they could take one card from anywhere. And they have decided to do this one right here, picking up both of these. And this is definitely very scary because the tenement does stack with all of the other uh, money multiplying options. So it looks like the blue player is setting themselves up to really never care about money. But maybe they're going a little bit too hard on it. We'll see what happens. Uh, they also both have the same symbol, which matches uh, symbols of cards they've played. So it's got a pretty good synergy for them. So they will now slide all of these down and we'll draw two more cards from the top of the deck. And now it's our turn to go. So we have four action spaces open to us and four money. And uh, I feel really good about uh, unlocking all these new action locations, but I do feel like we are falling really behind when it comes to just money generation. Both of our opponents have uh, a pretty good ability to make a lot of money, and we definitely don't. Uh, also, we haven't built any buildings yet. And I think that uh, four money is exactly what we need to go ahead and get a building built out there. And let's go ahead and do one of the trading locations so that it will generate money for us in the decline phase. So Let's go ahead and look at our options. Both of the trading navigation tiles are available. And, well, we could do this one for uh, uh, three plus actions, so four actions total, which would max out our track, or this one, which is uh, the token plus two, so three actions and four money. And interestingly enough, if we did this, we'd have one spot left over to do a taxation, which would actually cost us four money. So between these two, there is not much of a difference. So I figure let's go ahead and do this one, which leaves us uh, with one action slot left over, which uh, maybe instead of doing a taxation, we'll grab the starting player marker or something like that. 
I suppose the other thing to keep in mind is that we could flip one of these over and have it be a double, but we already have one of those on our timeline, and I don't really want to start the next round with two of these hourglasses already. So let's go ahead and just bite the bullet this round. We'll spend all four of our money and then build a trading house. Uh, the first thing to keep in mind is that the Vu player already built on this trading house, and this one is special. It gives the two points. There is one of these on the map for each of the three types. So you can see here is the one for the Oracle, and then the one for the Temple is right here as well. But another thing to keep in mind is that um, there are different regions that are kind of flush with the different types of uh, places. For instance, the green region has uh, three of the trading house spots, whereas uh, both, uh, whereas the yellow region only has one, and the red region has two of them. So I figure uh, what we're probably gunning for is more uh, end of turn uh, uh, bonuses, in which case you activate one building from each region. So let's go ahead and go over here, which is the only trading house in this region. And that means that uh, the next house we build, if we're still in money problems, we could do it in another one of these regions and activate all of them at the end of the round. Of course, you are not getting the uh, synergy bonus for putting buildings down into the same area, but uh, I'm really not sure how many buildings we're going to be doing this game. So we will put this one down right here and immediately activate yellow. This is the only building we have over here, so that's going to make us five money. That means we go from zero to five total, which is definitely a better situation. And with that, our turn is done. So we go to the green player, but they are full up on their track, so they have to pass, and we go down to blue. And they have decided to do a single hourglass taxation, and they are going to activate this hometown uh, building right here. You put the cube there to show that you can only do it once. So that means they are at four times two, or eight. And then, of course, when you factor in the uh, times two modifier of the well, that brings them from eight to 16 money for that one time spent. So pretty darn good for them. Okay, it's now back to us. We have one slot left over, and we could do a taxation and get four money. But uh, if we do that, then the starting player won't move, and we'll be the third player in round again. And going third is definitely not great uh, in these situations, especially with so few of these action options available to us, uh, especially the good ones. So I think let's go ahead and take the starting player token. It's going to be two less money, so we make two right now. But I think it'll be worth it to be the start player in the next round of the game. With that done, play now goes to the green, who is maxed out, and blue, who is maxed out. In fact, we are all done with our tracks, so that means the heyday phase is over, and we can now go into the decline. So the first thing that happens is uh, the start player is going to move up to us because we took that token, and now we can go ahead and reset all of the tokens on our tracks. So these can all go away, except, of course, for the double hourglasses, which are going to turn into single hourglasses. As part of this clearing action, you're also going to remove any of these cubes that show uh, you've used these one-time abilities from the hometown as well as any of the cards that we have played in our area. Next up, we advance the round marker so we see that we're going from the first era to the second era. And the first thing that happens is everybody gets to remove a cube from their time track, which means that everybody can do a little bit more in the next round of the game. And then all of the arrow one cards that are on display are going to get uh, grabbed and put into a discard pile because we're now in era two. So these don't matter. In fact, all of the arrow one cards in the draw pile are also going to go into a discard pile and we'll bring out the era two cards, give them a little shuffle, and then we will uh, go ahead and fill this row out. And it's worth uh, mentioning that over here, when you do the scribe actions, we've always been just uh, grabbing the cards from the middle, but now that there is a discard pile, there's also an act, uh, area over here which shows that you can pay a little bit more money and actually pull cards out of the discard pile that you were maybe interested in. So let's go ahead and repopulate this row. And now each player can activate one city from each of the regions. So that means that the blue player is going to get two points. The green player is going to get the uh, one uh, Oracle cube. And we are going to get five more money. Uh, none of us have actually grown into two regions just yet. This puts blue at 15 points. We now have 12 money total. And green has, once again, an Oracle cube. At this point, all players will activate any of their cards that have a decline phase uh, option. Uh, so the green player will do this one. They'll get two money for each of their merchants. They have six of them, so that is going to be 12 money coming in for them. And then down here, the blue player, they can spend three money up to five times to get one victory point each. And currently, over here, they have 21 money. When they consider they have access to these multipliers and they picked up another card with one of them on there, they figure they are going to go all out. So they're going to go ahead and spend the 15 money and they're going to grab five more points, which brings them up to 20. 
Lastly, each player will check to see if they have more than three cards in their hand, and nobody does, so there will be no penalties given out. And that means we now go into the first turn of the next round, and we are the starting player. We are starting things off with 12 money, but we have no cards available to ourselves, and all of these new Phase 2 cards have come out. So I think for our first turn, we should definitely try to pick up some new cards, and there are a couple new abilities here. Uh, first of all, you will probably notice that all of the requirements in general have gotten higher, so you just need more people in order to satisfy them. But also, we have a couple new things, specifically on these two cards. We see this right here says that whenever you do a Philosopher action, you actually get to spend exactly as much money as you want to, not necessarily what the tile says. And uh, the same thing goes right here for the scribe action. So this allows you to be a little bit more choosy with the specific uh, cards and tiles that you are activating and with how you spend your money. When we look down here to our trained population, we see that we have the three priests and uh, then we have one of everything else except for the uh, scholar down here. I guess we do have two of the merchants because of this bonus. But what that means is when we're looking at things that we want to draft, it's probably going to be things with a heavy priest bias. We don't have any of the oracle cubes yet to try and shift things around uh, quickly. And when I look out here, I see a couple of nice options, specifically these two cards here. Uh, this one needs three priests and this one needs two. And uh, they both require two uh, nobles, and we only have one noble at the moment. But if we uh, look over here, we already have the required artisan for this one, the required merchants for that, and I guess we are down one uh, scholar over here. So we're close to being able to do both of these, but they also both have the little uh, squiggle with a dot for their icons, and uh, two out of the three cards we have played already have that as well. So that synergizes pretty well, and uh, obviously the circle with the line would be better, but the only one that came out is all the way over here, and um, that's pretty darn expensive to get to. Maybe we can pick this up as it scoots down a little bit more. So I think let's go ahead and take the six money option. So that's going to be one time that's going to go down right here. We'll spend our six money, and with six, we can grab two from the bottom four, and it's going to be these two right here. Another benefit of the auditorium is that it has a permanent artisan and scholar, and when you mix that with our permanent merchant, that means we could just know that we have a permanent plus one to all three that are on this side. So let's go ahead and put these into our hand and slide everything down, and we reveal two new cards. And it looks like, uh, well, both of these have declined phases. This one just gives you plus uh, three victory points at the end of every turn, and there's another one of those right here. So that is going to finish up our turn, and now green can go. They have decided to start things off by going to the Chronicler. This is going to cost them two money and one time, so they will go down to 12 money total, and then they can go ahead and play this card right here. We see that the requirements are pretty low. It's just one uh, artisan and then two merchants. Well, they have six merchants, so they're definitely good when it comes to that. So they can go ahead and build this. Now, down here, you'll see they now have the ability to put a cube down on here and spend one time in order to do a scribe ability of up to four money. So this is going to be a nice way for them to try and refill their hand. Uh, it has the one uh, bonus point on it, and then we notice that it has the little uh, star symbol, which matches the same on all the cards they've done so far. So that's one, two, three, four points total for playing this card, which brings them up to nine. It's now time for the blue player to take their first turn of the round, and they're going to do a philosopher action, and they're going to do it for six money, and with it, they're going to activate uh, the uh, soldier as well as the scholar right here. You can see the six money allows them to take two uh, from within this area, so they're going to do one and one. This is going to cost them six money and one time, and that brings them down to just one money at the moment. And then, like I said, they're going to get one soldier, and they're going to grab one scholar. Lastly, they're going to go ahead and reset the row, putting the more expensive one into the line first. It's once again our turn, and we've got these two era two cards in our hand, and it sure would be nice to get these played out onto the board. So when we look at the requirements, we can see for this one, we need the one scholar, and then we also need the, uh, sorry, one noble and one scholar down here. And for this one, all we need is the one noble. And uh, this has a pretty nice ability. Uh, it is uh, similar to ones we've seen elsewhere, where it says every time we do a philosopher action for the rest of the game, we can uh, choose how much money we spend, uh, not necessarily what the tile says. And we have this uh, action down on our card, which we haven't used yet, which would synergize really well with this. So I think what we should do is start with that, since we only need one noble at the moment, and go ahead and take one of these cubes, put it down right over here, and this is going to cost us one time. 
because we can see the one hourglass on this little icon. So this means it's going to cost us two money, and that's also going to restrict our uh, options out on the philosophy track. But fortunately for us, the noble is over here, so well within the two money ability. Unfortunately, two is never going to get us two uh, training bumps, but uh, either way, this is still pretty good. So we could go ahead and activate this one, slide it all the way to the back. Spend our two money and then get our noble. And with that, our turn is over. It's now the green player's turn and they want to activate this ability on their card. We see that it is going to cost them one hourglass and four money and they can then do a scribe action. Four money means they can take any of the first four cards and they've decided to go ahead and grab this irrigation. We then slide all the cards down and draw the next card. And, oh, this one is interesting. I haven't talked about this reward just yet. Uh, this means that you can build a building for free in the uh, specific restriction. In this case, it has a wild spot. But you have the X there to show that you don't actually do any activations when that building goes down. But it is definitely good for your overall building infrastructure. Lastly, green, of course, has to spend the four money to activate that. And with that, their turn is done and blue can go. They currently only have one bunny, so they've decided to do a big turn to try and refill their coffers. They're going to do a double time taxation using two ones. That's going to be eight money, and then they are going to activate this hometown building right here to double it up to 16. And then, of course, they're going to activate their well, doubling this one more time. So they go all the way up to gaining 32 money. So now they have 33 total, and they're sitting pretty well here. <laughs> It's once again our turn, and last turn we set up the ability for us to get this theater built by getting that second noble, and I think that now is probably a good time to activate the Chronicle ability while they are still somewhat cheap. We only have four money available to ourselves right now, but we do have five action slots. That being said, I am still worried about our money generation, so I would like to get another one of these trade cities built on this turn. And so when we look at things, we can see that, well, we could take this Chronicler right here, which is three money and one uh, time, but it means that we will not have enough money to pay for the trade house action next turn. We could do it for free for three times. So that'd be one, two, three, four time and three money. If we did the inverse and we spent the four money doing this one and the two time, then that would be two time. And then we come back over here and do this for free plus two times. So that's four money and four time as opposed to three money and four time. So let's do the lower money one. And we will definitely uh, execute this plan and take this tile. When we pay for it, it brings us down to just one money left over. And then we can go ahead and get this built into our area. So this is going to generate us five points right off the bat. And it only has a little squiggly line icon. So when we slide this in over here, we see that we activate that one. And there are three of those already. So that's going to be five plus three or eight points. And for the rest of the game, whenever we do a philosopher action, we get to choose how much money we spend between one and eight. It's not dictated by the action itself. So that's a really good combo between these two things as well as the main actions out on the board. We were at 12 points, so this means we actually tie up with the blue player at 20. It's now Green's turn to take an action, and they're going to activate the four-cost navigation for building a temple. They decide to spend the time cost for this with a single token, and then, of course, they have to spend their four money, bringing themselves down to four money, and now they can go ahead and build this temple out on the board. First, they consider the other hometown spots. We see there are only these two left over, which are associated with these sets of icons. And at this point, this should all be familiar to you. They are the same icons that appear on the cards that we've been playing. And the green player decides that they don't want to do a hometown building. Instead, they're going to build over here in Troy. Now, if they were to build over in red, then they would activate all of the buildings in red and be able to get another cube for the Delphi here, but by going into a different region, they are planning on trying to get extra worth out of the end of round bonus where you pick one building in each zone. So they're playing a slightly more long-term uh, goal right here, but they are going to activate green and they only have the one building over here, which is going to make one cube in their temple area. This gets put over here, and the way these work is you can discard a cube to ignore one trained worker requirement on a card as you are playing it. And then, of course, you can spend three cubes mixed between your temple and your um, oracle in order to just permanently train somebody up. So they are just keeping themselves nice and flexible for trying to get their cards out. Next up, it's the blue player's turn, and they also want to navigate, and they are going to choose this one right here, allowing them to build an oracle. They decide to spend the time on this tile with two of the uh, time tokens, so that's going to go right there. They, of course, have to spend four of their money, and they are uh, completely full on their action, so this is the last one they're doing for this round, but they now get to build their third building. 
they are restricted into going into a spot with the Oracle symbol, and there is just one that makes victory points for each of the three symbols. They already have one down here for the trade goods, and they figure they're going to go over here to Apollonia and do the one for the Oracle. So now they have two out of the three already, and uh, if they get all three, that's really bad for us. Maybe we should consider trying to sneak in and get our building over here as well, but either way, with this place down, they then get to activate the yellow region. They only have the one building here, so that's going to make two points for themselves which brings them up to 22. It's now our turn and we have one money and a plan. We already talked about this on the last turn. We did the chronicle action knowing that we would do a navigation action next. And fortunately, nobody got in our way. So we're gonna go ahead and activate this one right here because we cannot afford the four money version. It is gonna cost us three extra time tokens though, which we are forced to pay with a single and a double hourglass, which is gonna finish off our track. And now we can go ahead and build our second building onto a trade house location. And I think that we want to put it over here into the green area. Now, we could put it down onto one of these over here, but none of those abilities are really calling to me right now. I suppose this one is nice to double up a taxation, but uh, these over here just generate five money every single uh, round, which is good as well. Uh, well, I guess every single round, as long as you are activating it is as the one from the region. And the reason I think we should go over here as opposed to over here is because it would be nice to try and swing it over here and uh, build a building over here on the next round. And that would be our uh, third build one in each round so we can activate all of these. Uh, of course, once you do your fourth building, then you're going to have to start making some choices there. But for now, I think we're going to put this down in Sidon and activate the green area, which is going to make five bucks for us. This brings us up to six money total, and now the green player can go. Before they take their main action, they're going to use the Oracle special action by discarding this cube, and now they get to modify their trained people twice. They will reduce their merchants by one and their artisans by one in order to go up with one scholar and then up with one noble. Next up, they're going to do a chronicler action, and they're going to go ahead and take one of these free ones that have the two action requirement. They're going to pay for it with two tokens, and then obviously it costs no money, so they can now go ahead and play the card, and it is called the winery. We see that they now have the one noble necessary. They have the one priest, as well as easily enough of the merchants. So when this goes down, they're going to get three points. It's also going to generate an artisan, and it's also going to generate a merchant. And this is one of the reasons they bumped this down, is because they didn't want to lose the free bump over there. They instead decided to kind of squeeze things around so they could uh, have that bump go up on these other two instead. So with that, they can now play this card into their tableau. We see that it has the star icon just like the rest of their cards, so that is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, plus 3, or 7 points. They were at 9, and now they go up to 16. With that complete, their turn is now done, and if we look around, we see that everybody has filled up all of their actions, so everybody passes, and we now move into the decline phase. Nobody took the starting player marker, so that's great for us. That means that we get to be the starting player for the next turn, and now we can go ahead and start clearing off all of the tokens from our areas, and we will flip over any of the double hourglasses. It looks like we are going to have one of those as will our green opponent. But when we look down here, we see that the blue player did not have any of these, so they're going to have a completely empty field to play with on the next turn. We, of course, also clear the cubes off the cards and any hometown buildings. Next, we advance the round marker. We are in round four, but the era did not change. And now each player gets to activate one city per region, and we'll start with ourselves uh, because we are easy. We have five money over here and five money over there, so that means uh, it's simple. We just take ten money. Uh, next up, we have the green player, and they just have the two buildings out right now. They are in different regions, so there's no decision to be made. They're going to take a cube into their oracle area and a cube into the temple. And lastly, the blue player activates both of these regions, uh, both of which generate them two victory points. So they are essentially saying they don't need resources, they just need the end product, so that's going to be four more points for them. They were at 22, so now they go to 26. Next, all players activate all of their decline phase abilities, and unfortunately, with four cards, we still haven't uh, picked up any of those, but our green opponent does. They're going to get two points per merchant they have, which is still six, so that is 12 money coming in. And then we have the blue player, who can once again spend three money up to five times to get one point each, and they have tons of money, so they figure that is fine with them. They're going to spend the 15 money to get five more points. This shoots them up to 31 points, and I think we're starting to get a little bit concerned about the blue player's victory point engine. They are certainly doing very well for themselves. 
Lastly, we check the hand limits for all the players, but nobody has more than three cards, so nobody gets penalized, and that completes the decline phase. We can now move into the heyday phase of the fourth round, and we get to take the first turn. When we consider the fact that we have two buildings built so far, and they're both trade houses, and this is the last of the victory point building spots on the board, I think we should go ahead and do this for our first action. Let's go ahead and take this navigation uh, token so we spend less time. This costs us four money, but we have a reasonable amount of money at this point. And I think getting this down is going to be good for us because if we activate it every round, that is going to be uh, six more from the uh, the client phases and two for actually hitting it. So it's an eight point play. And if we build more buildings in the red area, which I think we'll be uh, inclined to do, then we could get even more points out of it. So let's go ahead and do it. When it comes to paying for the time, I think let's do a double time marker. This leaves us flexible for the rest of the round. We have lots of spaces uh, left with which we can hopefully do some other really good stuff. And of course, we have to pay the for money to make this happen. And we can go ahead and build the building. When it's placed down, we activate the red region. It's the only building in there so far, though, so that's going to get us two points. It's now time for Green to take their turn, but before their main action, they're going to remove this Oracle Cube to move around two uh, sets of their people, and they've decided to lose two of their merchants. Um, they are just going to make less money in this decline phase, or maybe they'll find a way to bump that back up again. But with each of those uh, downgrades, they can then bump up one, and in this case, they'll do one of their Scholars and one Priest. Now for their main action, they've decided to go over to the Chronicle section, and they're going to take this uh, cheapest one right here. It'll be two money and one time. They currently have 16 money available, so they go ahead and spend that, and they can now play this card right here. We see the requirements are that they must have a temple, and they do out on the map in the uh, Troy spot, and then they have the two priests and the two scholars down here. They can now add this into their tableau of cards, and they are the first one to get to five cards. We currently have four. The blue player is doing very well with only two cards at this point, but when we look over here, we see they're going to get five points for this card, and then they're definitely going to activate these stars because they have five of those as well, so that's a ten-point play. And for the rest of the game, whenever they do a scribe action, they can pay the amount of money they want to, not necessarily the amount dictated on the action, and that is going to work really well with this bonus action that they have on this card right here. They were at 16, and this jumps them all the way up to 26, and suddenly green's not looking so bad. At this point, I think it's time to explain these three objective stacks in the bottom right corner of the board. Now, uh, essentially, the first person to beat the requirement is going to get the eight victory points as printed on the top. This one is first person to eight played cards. This is the first person to having all 18 uh, people deployed in their area, and this is the first person to get all six of their buildings out. Every subsequent person still has access to this bonus, but it will be four points instead of eight. And so at the moment, uh, the one that we're closest to is over here. We have four cards out of eight played. The green player has five, which is really good for them. And then uh, we are tied with the blue player over here. Uh, each of us have three of our buildings out. So these will probably come into play in the next round or two, but not this round, I don't think. It's now the blue player's turn, and they've decided to do a scribe action. They're going to do the cheap one over here, which is six money and then only one time. And I think it's worth uh, describing how this discard mechanic works, even though the blue player is not going to be doing it. Now, everything we've been doing so far in this game has just been uh, gaining cards through the card that we're taking. But with this big slash, we then see this alternate option where you can spend six money to pull one out of the discard pile or ten money to pull two out of the discard pile. Uh, like I said, the blue player isn't interested in doing that. Instead, they want this hospital. Um, they're paying six for this, which means they could take two cards from this point and lower, but uh, they already have two cards in their hand, and they're a little worried about taking too many, so they're just going to be grabbing this one right here. All of the cards will slide down, and we can reveal a new one. They, of course, have to pay for the action, and they were at 14 money, so now they're going to go down to eight money, and then when they go ahead and put this card in their hand, their turn is now over. It's once again our turn, and we only have this one card in our hand. We are a little bummed about that hospital being taken by the blue player. Uh, part of me did want to try and get that one and work it in, but I don't think we would have had enough time to actually get it played. Certainly not this turn. So either way, we're going to roll with the options we have available to ourselves. And right now, it would be really great to get this auditorium out. 
we have the two nobles, we definitely have the priests, we also have the artisans and the merchants, but we do need one uh, scholar, and we still only have zero scholars down here. So that means I think we should go ahead and get scholars. In fact, uh, we are in the uh, fourth turn right now, which means in the fifth round we're going to clear off all these cards and bring out uh, the Era 3 cards, which require even more of these people as a requirement. So I think that gathering new people is definitely a good idea, at least for our current plans, but also for future ones. And one option for ourselves is to go right here and then spend as much as we want in order to get the scholar that we need. When we look up to the philosopher section, we find out that unfortunately, this pesky scholar is almost the most expensive thing on the area. But this is the thing that we need, and we could take one of these tiles, or instead, we can activate this card that we have in our area. Now, we could use this once per turn, and normally, it would only allow us to do a purchase of up to two. But on the last round, we picked up this card right here, which changes that ability for ourselves, so we can spend as much money as we want. So in that case, I think that we're going to want to activate, we're going to spend seven money in order to grab this scholar right here, and then we can look at our board and figure out which one of these we want to take as a second, or maybe we'll take another scholar. Uh, I don't think it's worth spending the extra money to get access to another noble, though. So we go ahead and spend the time and the cube to activate the monument, and then we're going to spend our seven money, which brings us down to five total. And then we can go ahead and take our scholar and now figure out what else we want to bump up. Uh, everything is good except for the nobles. Well, we know that the auditorium is now fine, and we could uh, analyze all the cards out here on the row, but realistically, when we think about it, we know that on the next turn, we're going to want to play this auditorium down, which is going to consume at least two out of the three uh, spaces that we have. On a following turn, we could then do a scribe action and try to get more cards, which will consume a couple more spaces, which is going to leave us with zero or one locations left, which means we will not be playing any of these cards on this turn, and none of these are really jumping out at me right now, and part of me feels like maybe we should just set ourselves up to, do, to go big on the uh, fifth round, which will be the first one in the third era, where the cards get um, a lot more expensive, but they're also worth a lot more points. They no longer will have any of the uh, icons in the top right corner, but they might say like 12 or 15 points on the card, which is a pretty big deal. So uh, with all that uh, being said, I think we should just go even for now. We know that once this auditorium is played, all three of these will have a virtual worker there. So that means the worst one we have right now is the soldier over here. So we'll bump them up. This means that we activated both of these. So we can go ahead and slide all this stuff down. Next up, it is the green player's turn and they also want to do a philosopher action. They're gonna go ahead and take this cheap version right here and that's gonna gain them access to these bottom two right here, which is the uh, artisan and the merchant. First things first, they are going to pay for the tile and then they're gonna go ahead and they're gonna take one artisan, one merchant, and they're gonna take another artisan. Uh, of course, if they took another merchant, that would be another two money for them in this decline phase. But at this point, they are thinking it might make more sense to try and get to the three level over here with this artisan, considering there's a bunch of new stuff coming out and they don't currently have any more of these oracle cubes on this round to kind of shift things around. And now they're going to go ahead and end their turn by resetting this market. It's now the blue player's turn, and it looks like they also want to come to the Philosopher area. This is the third one of these in a row, and they're going to take this expensive one right here that has a cost of eight. That means that uh, all of these are available to the blue player, and they've decided they want to activate their merchants as well as their scholars. When we come back over to their area, they go ahead and pay this cost, which is all of their money exactly, and now they're going to go ahead and take one scholar and one merchant. They are now going to reset this area, and we'll see if this Philosopher spot continues to be such a hot commodity. Well, considering how it's now our turn, there's only one more Philosophy spot, and it costs six, and we only have five money. That's definitely not something we're going to do, so it's not going to be four of those actions in a row, and that's fine because we actually want to get this Auditorium down instead. So we are going to go ahead and do a Chronicler action. We can now choose one of these various options, and I think we may as well take this one. Three money and one time is probably better than zero money and two time, considering with that one time we are saving, we could of course come over here and do a taxation for four money. So I think this is a bit of a no-brainer right now. So we can go ahead and pay for this action. That's going to leave us with two money left over, 
and now we can play this card. We uh, have the nobles, the priests, the artisans, the merchants, and the scholars uh, necessary. There's a lot of people that need to come together to make one of these auditoriums, but now we are going to get some pretty nice rewards. Specifically, we now have a virtual artisan and a virtual scholar um, mixed with our virtual, virtual merchant means we can just consider all of these at plus one, and the card itself is worth four points. When we add it into our tableau area, we see that it has the little squiggly mark, and we have four of those now, so that's going to be four plus four, or eight points for playing the card. Well, we were at 22, so now we're up at 30, and we're once again in the mix. Okay, it's now the green player's turn, and they've decided to do the scribe action on their card right here. That's going to cost them one time, and normally it would be a four money action, but because of this ability right here, they can actually spend uh, whatever money they want to from one to ten. Unfortunately for them, even though they have that cool ability, they actually want the card that's at four money. They could spend more than that in order to take more cards down the line, but they don't really like any of those right there, so they're going to grab this one, and then everything is going to slide down. We can go ahead and refresh the row, and then they end their turn by spending the four money. All right, it's once again Blue's turn, and they're going to do their big taxation turn, so they'll do the uh, two-time uh, versions. That's going to get them eight money. They will activate this uh, hometown right here, making it a 16. And just like before, with the help of their well, that's going to get them up to 32 money. So they go from zero to 32, and they're once again ready to spend a whole bunch of it. Okay, it is now our turn, and we have three action slots left to ourselves, and just two money. And I think what we should probably do is try to get another one of our buildings out onto the map. And let's go ahead and take a look at some of the options. When we consider that right now money seems to be our biggest issue still, I suppose we could go up here and do a hometown that would allow us to uh, double up on taxation. But I think at this point we haven't actually taxed at all in this game, and I wouldn't mind keeping that up. You know, uh, I feel like uh, doing other things that will uh, get us money as well as uh, potentially victory points or working us closer to getting objectives like this is probably the better thing for us. So let's go ahead and look out over here. And if we built, uh, say, a trade area right here, that would get us five money, and it would activate this zone, uh, which would give us another five money, so that'd be ten money right now. And at the end of the round, we would just activate uh, one of these two, so that'd be another ten, and two for doing this building right here. But instead, if we went over here and uh, built a building down there, when we activated a red, we would get five money and two points for this. And then at the end of the round, when we choose between all three of these sections, we could dodge this and do 5, 10, 15, which is the same thing as essentially 20 and 2 points uh, in this circumstance and 20 and 2 points in the other one. Obviously, we wouldn't get the 2 points at the end of the round, but we'd essentially be cashing in on those 2 points right now. And that means we'd have 2 buildings over here, which means in the subsequent rounds, if we put our last 2 buildings into this area, every time we go here, we're going to get even more money and we're going to continue to get the points, whether it is in the middle of the round or at the end of the round. So I think let's go ahead and build over there. We currently have two money, so that means we have to go with this free option with the three time requirement, which means that unfortunately that is our second double hourglass on the row. So that means we're going to have two hourglasses already down on the next turn, but I guess realistically we're just um, paying right now with next turn's action, so it all kind of works out. And now let's go ahead and place this building down. As we decided, we're going to put it into Crotonia. I guess we could also put it down here. It doesn't really matter between the two. That is going to generate for us five money when we activate this location, and then two victory points down here. We were at 30, which means we are now just barely in the lead at 32. With that, we are now done, so the green player can go, and they've decided to do a Chronicler action. There's only one more single-time option available to themselves, and they're going to go ahead and grab it. This tile also comes with a cost of four, so that's going to bring them down to just two. And then they're going to play this card right here. It is the Meeting Place. They uh, have a temple over in Troy, and we see that they have the two nobles. They definitely have the one priest. They have the three artisans. And then down here, they easily have the merchant taken care of. And in fact, this card is going to get them another merchant. So they're going to max out there once again, uh, just in time for the end of the round, considering that was their last action, in order to get some more uh, money for that decline phase option. Next, they go ahead and add that into their tableau. This is their sixth card, so there's two away from grabbing that objective. And we see that it is six points by itself, and they have one, two, three, four of those uh, circle slash uh, symbols. So that's going to be a 10-point card play. This means our time in the lead was very short-lived as green goes from 26 up to 36. With green's turn done, now the blue player gets to go, and they've decided they would also like to do a chronicler action. 
their options are spend zero money or one money. So they're going to go ahead and take the zero. And they're going to go ahead and slide that over onto their track, filling it up. And now they can activate this card right here. So this is the hospital. They have a temple as their hometown. And we now see that they have the three merchants and the three scholars necessary to make this card happen. The first thing that happens is they oops, are going to generate one uh, soldier down here, and then they get to pull off one of their cubes. So that means that uh, they went from zero back to one action available to themselves, and now they can add this into their tableau. For a little while now, the blue player has been ignoring cards, so this is only their third one, and we see that, unfortunately, that symbol doesn't match up with any of the other uh, ones they have. In fact, it's completely excluded, so that means they're just going to get three points plus one point, so four points total for putting that down, but they still feel like it was worth it in order to get that cube off. They were at 31, and four points brings them up to 35, and unfortunately, we're in the back of the pack again. At this point, it would be our turn, but we are full up on our tokens. So now it goes to the green player, who is also full, which means that blue gets to go again. They only have one slot left open, and instead of getting more uh, money from taxation, they've decided to become the start player. This has been the second turn in a row where they've gone third, and they don't really like that. So they'll put this down right here. They will get two money for that action. It does not get multiplied by this bonus because that is specific to taxation. And with that, uh, the uh, heyday phase is over, and we can go into the decline phase. The first thing we'll do is check to see if somebody took start player, which they did. So we are now going second instead of first, and I think we're pretty okay with that. Next up, we clear off all of the tokens from the hometown, as well as the cards, as well as all of the tokens on our area. So we can remove all of these and see that uh, we are unfortunately the only player who is going to be starting the next round with two uh, hourglasses on their spot. So that's certainly not good. And the green player is feeling pretty good about the fact that they are starting with a completely clean area. Next, we move the turn marker over to the fifth turn, and we see that we are now entering the third era, and everybody gets to remove one more cube from their time tracks. Next up, it's time to bring in the third era cards, which means we're going to discard everything that is out here on the line, including the deck over here into the discard pile, and now we can bring out some new, fancy, very expensive cards. So we can just lay them out. And as I mentioned before, none of these cards have the symbols in the top right, but we can always go into the discard pile in order to pick up some that do. But instead, the cards themselves just have big, chunky victory point amounts on them, although the requirements are quite high. You have the Colossus over here that needs two trade cities. The Pyramid needs one of each. And uh, also, some of these require five of the different population in these areas. Next up, each player can activate one city per zone, and for the first time, we have a decision to make here. Uh, well, first of all, we get five for this and five for that, so that's 10 money. But now we need to decide, do we want 15 extra money or 10 money and two points? And considering right now we only have seven money, I think let's go ahead and take the 15. I really hate saying no to victory points, but like I said, we already got the two points essentially for this when we built this building down on the last turn. So we get our 15, and we're now at 22 total. Next up, we have green, who is going to get one cube in their oracle spot and one cube into the temple. This brings their total number of cubes in the temple to four, and if they ever max out, they can't put another one in there. So they are going to be incentivized to start spending these, but I don't think that's going to be a problem for them. Lastly, we have the blue player, who is once again going to get two plus two or four victory points for these two cities, which puts them back in the lead at 39. Next up, we once again have all the players activating their decline abilities. It's still just two, which is a little bit surprising, but I guess that's just how the cards uh, came out and the decisions we had available to ourselves. So we're going to get nothing right now. The green player is going to continue to get two money for each of their merchants. So that is going to be 12 more money for themselves. And then the blue player, once again, they have the ability to spend um, three money for one point uh, five times. And they're going to go ahead and do it for the max once again. So that is 15 money going away for five more points. And they were at 39, so now they're at 44. The last thing for us to do is check our hand size, and it looks like we have no cards, green has no cards, and the blue player, they only have two, which is fine. It's interesting that both of them are arrow one cards. They've been sitting around for quite some time. We'll see if they actually get those out. But with that, we are done with the decline phase. We can now move into the heyday phase for the uh, fifth round of the game, and the blue player is going to lead things off. For the first action, Blue decides to come to the Scribe area, and they're going to spend the uh, most money they can. <laughs> Ten money and two time, so that they will be able to grab two cards from the entire set. And they want this Aqueduct here, as well as this Observatory. We can go ahead and refill this right now. 
They of course have to pay for this action, which brings them down to nine money, and then they get their two cards, and they are done with their turn. Uh, they're currently at four cards, but you only check for the penalty of more than three cards at the end of a round. We are now up next, and we have no cards in our hand and 22 money available to ourselves. And with all of these big cards out, I think it's definitely time for us to try and pick some things that are going to work well with us to try and formulate a strategy for uh, this turn and potentially next turn. And the first thing that I notice when I look out here is that one of these, the Colossus, actually removes an action cube. And when we look at the requirements for it, we're actually very close. Its city requirement is to have two trade cities, and we have three of them, so we're fine there. We would need two soldiers, which we have, two priests, which we have, two merchants, which we have, because remember, we have the virtual uh, version of all three of these. The only thing we're off is just one artisan, which shouldn't be too hard to pick up, so I do think that we're interested in grabbing this. It'll also make us a merchant, which doesn't particularly help us for our plan right now, but it's also worth 11 points, and uh, removing a cube is going to be good, considering we have these two turns left. And then when we look right next door, this one right here requires uh, two soldiers, which we have, two priests, two um, uh, merchants, and two scholars. We have all of those except for the four nobles. So we're two off on this one and one off on that one. I think being three off total for picking up two of these uh, third era cards is a great spot to be in, especially considering we can pick both of these up for just six money. So let's go ahead and take this uh, scribe action. We, of course, have to pay for it. And then we can grab these two cards that we wanted. These go into our hand, and our turn is over, but we can go ahead and refresh this row again. It's now time for Green to take their action, and it looks like uh, Gathering Cards is all the rage right now, because they're going to activate this power right down here on their card, which again would normally cost them the one time and let them spend up to four money, but with this ability they can spend one to ten money. And they really like the idea of this pyramid and this music school right here. And when we look up here, we see that they can spend seven money in order to take both of these. And in fact, uh, you may have noticed that seven does not show up on any of these tiles. Uh, these specific costs are laid out like this for the people who have the ability to pay what they want. So the green player is going to grab both of these for the seven money. And we can, of course, refresh the row. They had 14 money, so now they have seven left over. And these two cards in their hand, and their turn is done. It's now once again the blue player's turn, and they're going to go up here to the philosophy area because they are interested in training a priest as well as an artisan. And it is worth mentioning that with this hometown right here, they're still the only one who's built one so far, and they could, instead of doubling their money, they could just uh, take an extra person when they do a philosopher action. But they are still valuing that money doubler uh, over the actual extra person, which probably does make sense for them. So in this case, all they need is six money in order to grab these two. They, of course, have to pay for this, and they're going to go ahead and gain that artisan and that priest, costing them six money. And then they finish out their turn by resetting the training row. Okay, it's once again our turn, and our priority is getting these cards out, in particular, the Colossus, because the sooner we're able to get this extra action done, the better. Or specifically, we want to make sure this happens on this round of the game. And when we look at our requirements, well, we can see that for the palace, all we need is two of the nobles. And right now, the noble is the cheapest uh, person in the training area. But again, this is not our priority. The Colossus is. And in order to get the Colossus made, we simply need one more artisan because we essentially have two with our uh, virtual one hanging out over there. So I think let's go ahead and use our ability down here. We'll put a cube down that says we can spend up to two money, and that's going to cost us one time. But this ability will now trigger, allowing us to spend as much money as we want to. So when we look to the philosophy track, we see that the artisan is over here at seven money in order to grab two of them. Or we could spend three to just get one. But I don't know. It does seem to make sense to keep uh, hiring people while we can. So we could spend essentially four extra money to hire one extra person from uh, lower down on the list. And it is a bit of a bummer because we could spend three money just to hire two of these right now uh, instead of uh, going after this single one right here. But we really do want to get that Colossus built. So I figure let's just go ahead and do it. Maybe this isn't the smartest thing in the world, but we know we need nobles even though they're cheap. So let's go ahead and get one of each. This costs us seven money, so we are now at nine. And now we get our artisan and our noble. And then we, of course, end our turn by resetting the training row. Next up, we have the green player's turn, and they've decided to do a navigation action to get another building out. Specifically, they've decided to grab this one right here, so they'll spend four money and two time to get a trade city out. 
when they go ahead and pay for this action, it's going to bring them down to just three money. When they come out to the map, they notice that there are no more trading uh, locations down in the yellow region, but there's one in red and one in green. But they've decided they're actually going to do a new uh, hometown location. It's going to be the second one of the game, and it goes in the trading spot right over here because they are interested in gaining access to these two abilities. We can see that one of them would allow them to use this city once per round in order to pay what they want, and the other one would allow them to use this city in order to just use it one time and do a higher of up to uh, four money on the Philosopher track. And that's pretty good for the green player, considering they already have a permanent plus one whenever they go to that location. So after this gets built, they now get to choose one of the three regions, and they're going to activate every uh, city in it. In this case, they'd really like a cube in their oracle spot, so they're going to activate the red region in order to get it. And I've just realized they have these little white dots next to the cities, so I've moved the cities over there so it's easier to see what the icons are. With this cube, they're now at two in their oracle location, and they are very flexible to do some manipulating of their population. But with that, they are done with their turn, and blue can now go. Since blue currently only has three money, they've now decided this is the part of the turn where they tax. So they're going to do a double taxation like normal, getting them to eight, activating this like normal, bringing that to 16, and then doubling it at the well. So that is going to be 32 more money available to themselves, bringing them up to a nice even 35. And this is a really nice combo for them. But uh, another thing to keep in mind is they're spending two actions a turn in order to pull this off and uh, liquidating a lot of it into victory points, which is doing pretty well for them. So we'll see how this uh, low uh, number of card strategy works versus uh, us who are just putting a lot of cards out. Uh, their synergy is pretty good, though. So anyway, they are done with their turn and we can now go. I think it's finally time to go to the Chronicler and get this Colossus built. Uh, interestingly enough, nobody has taken any of these yet, and that's because the requirements are getting so much harder that uh, there's a lot less likely that my opponents, and I guess us as well, uh, have been able to fulfill the cards themselves in the early rounds. So that's great for us because it means we get the cheapest one right here at two money and one time. This brings us down to seven money total. And then just to double check, yes, we have the two trade cities. We have the three artisans with our virtual person, the two merchants with our virtual person, two soldiers, and two priests. All right, so this is going to, first of all, create a merchant for ourselves. Next, it is going to remove an action cube, so we only have one of them left. And now we can go ahead and slide this in. And there is going to be no bonus scoring because there are no uh, symbols on these uh, third era cards. But we do get a straight 11 points for this card. This means we go from 32 all the way to 43. Before taking their main action, the green player is going to do one of their oracle cubes, and with it, they are going to reduce their scholars down by two and bump up their uh, priests by two. Next up, they're going to evaluate a chronicler action, and they're going to pull this three money option. When they go ahead and pay for this action, we see that this is going to bring them down to zero money. They had exactly enough. And now they're going to go ahead and get a pyramid built. Uh, we see that it requires four priests, which they have, uh, five merchants, which they definitely have, and three artisans. Also, they must have a temple, an oracle, and a trade house building built. When we look out to the map to double check, we see an oracle, a temple, and a trade house over here. So they are good to build the pyramids. The first thing this does for them is it's going to create a scholar and then it is going to use up one of their merchants. So that's not too great for them, but then it gives them 18 points when they tuck it into their tableau. This is also their seventh card. So they're just one away from grabbing that eight point objective for being the first one to eight played cards. Green now goes ahead and gets those 18 points. They were at 36. So this is going to bring them all the way up to 54. And we could put this uh, 50 plus token down here to remind ourselves. And they're now in a pretty good lead. For Blue's main action, they've decided to go navigating, and they're going to go ahead and take this uh, token right here. Uh, they're going to spend four money and two hourglasses in order to build on an oracle location. This will be the last action they're going to take on this turn, and that brings them down to 31 total, but this building's now going to go out. And they've decided to put it over here in Cyrene, which is now going to activate the yellow area, getting themselves one oracle cube and then two victory points. So they go from 44 to 46. They then gain their first Oracle Cube of the game, and their turn is now over. It's once again our turn, and we have four action slots available to ourselves, which is really rather nice. And we would like to get this palace built, but we're still just one noble shy of uh, matching the requirements for this. And we now know that the blue player has four out of their six buildings built, so I think 
what we should probably do right now is get another one of these buildings out. Uh, specifically, it'd be great to get an oracle so that we could ship things around it nicely, but uh, at the moment, I think uh, it's going to be a temple just based off of the availability out there on the map. But I do think that uh, getting our fifth out of six down is good this turn so that we can easily put our sixth one down next turn, uh, get some nice benefits for it, and then also get that eight points for being the first one to do it, and potentially the only person but to do it. But I think this is still a pretty good plan for us. When we look out to the map, we see that the reason I think we're going to do temples and not oracles is because this red region is easily the best spot for us to uh, activate now because we already have two uh, buildings over here and there are no more open uh, oracle locations. And I do think that we're going to want to get a cube of some sort. We could go here and get money, but uh, gaining a uh, cube on the temple or the oracle is certainly nice uh, for this uh, very ending part of the game. So we can just uh, lose one of those cubes and match requirements so we don't have to do like an entire philosopher action or something like that. So I think let's go ahead and navigate. And, you know, money is somewhat tight for us. And at the moment, we've got four action spaces left over. So we could either take this for zero money and three actions, which is going to uh, fill out our four when we include this tile. Or we could do that one for one less action and four more money. But then for our last action, we'd probably just tax for four. I mean, we could also take the first player marker, I suppose. But right now, we are uh, going second, which isn't too bad. I guess we may as well stay flexible just in case something wacky goes along. Since they're functionally uh, identical to us, let's go ahead and spend the four money and the two actions. I do think that we should put the hourglasses down like this. We could flip over and do a double and have two spots left over, but I don't know. I really want to leave the last turn as open as possible, and we don't desperately need to get something done on this turn versus the next turn as far as the bonuses and whatnot that we're getting. So we've put this down. We've got to pay for it, bringing ourselves down to just three money, and now we can build our fifth building. At this point, our plan is pretty set, so let's go ahead and build over here in Sparta, and now we can activate the red region, so that's going to get us two victory points, one cube into our temple, and five money, which is certainly a very nice activation. And those two points might not seem like much, but it brings us up to 45, and it just kind of keeps us plodding along. It's now the green player's turn, and they've decided to be pretty simple. They're just going to take the starting player token, which is pretty unfortunate for us. That means we're going to go third in the last round of the game, but green's happy about it. They're going to go first. At this point, play comes down to the blue player, but they have to pass because they are out of action spots. So now we get to take our last action, and it looks like we don't have the starting player as an option anymore. So I think we're just going to go ahead and do a taxation for a single hourglass, which is going to give us four more money. This means we're now back to the green player, and they are simply going to do a taxation as well for a single hourglass, which is going to be four money. So that brings them up to six, and now they have one action spot left. And with it, they're going to activate their hometown over here. And they're going to use this on this location right here so they can spend four money right now and uh, one time in order to do a buy from the philosopher market. But if you remember, the green player has a permanent plus one from a card that they built all the way at the beginning of the game. So when they come over to the training market, they decide they want a merchant, no surprise there. And they would also like uh, one of the scholars here that works out because four money gains them access to the whole line for just one. And then their plus one allows them to go ahead and grab one else. So that's going to be these two right here. We may as well reset the line right now. And then green goes ahead and maxes out their merchants again and grabs a noble. And if you notice that uh, all, with their tokens, these two are touching, these two are one away, and these two are one away as well. So that means they have 16 total population. And if they hit 18 population and they're the first one to do it, they will get eight extra victory points. And it's starting to look pretty likely that they'll be able to do that on the last round of the game, which is certainly not good for the rest of us. This action, of course, costs an hourglass, so with that, green is now done, and we are all going to pass, because everybody has filled up their action rows, so let's now uh, end the heyday phase and go into the decline phase. First things first, the starting player token is going to move over to the green player, and then we're just going to clean up all of our cards, as well as our hometown areas and our uh, time rows. We can now move the game marker to the sixth turn, and uh, we don't cross over an era, so nothing happens there. It's now time for us to activate our cities, one per region, so that's going to be five money for this one, five money for that one right there, and then we have a choice. Do we take five more money, or do we take a cube for our temple, or do we just take two uh, victory points? And I think, well, when you consider the fact that at the end of the game, ten coins equals one uh, victory point, let's go ahead and take the points for now. So we go from 45 to 47, and now have 22 money. 
Next up, the blue player can go and they decide to do four victory points instead of two points and a cube. So that means they get to put this 50 point marker right there and jump all the way to 50 exactly. And then green grabs another temple cube and oracle cube. With this, they're actually maxed out on their temple cube, so I imagine they'll start burning through these, considering it is the last round of the game. Next up, each player activates all of their decline phase options, but it's still just the two. So the green player, they still have their six merchants, so that is going to be 12 more money for themselves. And then down here, the blue player, they decide in order to stay um, up with the race, they are going to do the max payout on this one again. So that is going to cost them 15 money in order to get five more victory points which puts them once again in the lead at 55. Lastly, we have to check our hand limits, and unfortunately, the blue player still has those four cards in their hand. I straight up forgot about this penalty for the blue player, but that is how this game is progressing, so that means they have one card over three, so that does mean they have to put an extra hourglass down on their board. That could really cost them, uh, and I feel kind of bad about it for them, but either way, that's how it played out, and with that, uh, we can now go into the heyday phase of the sixth and final round of the game, and green is going to start us off. The first thing they're going to do is activate their private scribe ability. That's going to cost them one time, and they can spend as much money as they want to because of this ability here. When they look out to the card row, they would like to pick up both of these cards right here, and we see that in order to do that, they're going to have to spend eight money. So these are going to go into their hand. We can go ahead and slide everything down. It looks like the final two cards have now come out. And, uh, oh, this one's interesting. In the decline phase, you get one point for every building that you've constructed. It's a shame that it is so expensive to get to, but that would be worth five or six points for us at the end of the round. But I guess the card itself is only worth five points. So this probably would have been better for us if we'd have been able to get it built last round. So uh, either way, uh, green can now continue with their turn. So green goes ahead and pays their eight money. This leaves them with 10 left over. And at this point, you might be thinking, how the heck does the green player think they're going to get three of these cards played by the end of the turn? And uh, that's because there is something going on with the end game scoring. Now, they're going to try and get as many of these played as they can. But when the game is over, each player is going to have the ability uh, to score every single one of the cards in their hand based off of the requirements that are out here on the board. But they will only get half of the points from that card. So uh, the green player is likely planning on having at least one of these cards uh, not actually be played in this round, but they'll try to set up their population so that they can meet the requirements and at least get half points, which could still be something like six, seven, or eight points, depending on the card that they have left in their hand. It's now the blue player's turn, and they're going to go ahead and do their Oracle special action. They're going to reduce their soldiers by two in order to bump up their artisans by one and their merchants by one. Next up, they're going to go to the Chronicler and grab the two money, one hourglass option. They're going to go ahead and pay for this, which is now going to bring them to 14 money total. And now they're going to play, it looks like, the Observatory. So when we look uh, to their requirements, it doesn't need any buildings. It needs one noble. It needs a priest. They have one of each of those. They need the three artisans the two merchants, and the three scholars. So they are good for this one. And in fact, it's going to create a, another scholar when it gets built. And then when it gets slid into the tableau, it's going to generate 12 victory points. Considering they were at 55, this is going to jump them up to 67. Okay, it's now time for our first turn, and we have 11 action slots available to ourselves, as well as 22 money. And realistically, we kind of need to plan out our entire round to make sure that we don't run out of actions or money to do the things we want to do, because this is it. This is the last round of the game. And there are a couple things to consider. The first is, of course, we want to get this palace built. Uh, all we need to get this built is just one more of these nobles up here, and it is going to generate a, uh, a soldier. And it's very interesting when we look out to the cards that just appeared, this assembly right here is uh, a very good match for the setup that we have right now because, uh, well, that soldier, if we did this first, would get us the one soldier we would need to match this. We already would have the uh, nobles, the uh, artisans, the merchants, and the uh, scholars down here because, again, we have those uh, virtual people in our uh, tableau. The last thing we would need is just one of the priests in order to make this one work. And so what that means is in order to get both of these cards played, we realistically need 
uh, one uh, noble and one priest because this will feed into that. And that does not even use this cube that's hanging out right here. And we know that we want to get this building built out probably into the red area, which is probably going to generate for us um, two more cubes or uh, maybe some extra money. We're not sure when we get to that point, but at least one more cube. And as I just mentioned before, when the game is over, any cards left in our hand are going to be worth uh, half their victory points if we can match their, um, their requirements. What I didn't say is any cards in our hand where we don't match the requirements will also be worth uh, minus points equal to half the points on the card. So we want to make sure we can pull that off. But when we consider all these things and the fact that we can do a uh, relatively cheap training down here, at least cheap uh, according to time, I think let's go for it. Let's try and get uh, to grab two of the cards out here. And we know that we want to grab this assembly. So in order to grab two, we would need to get uh, the 10 money and uh, spot to get the two cards down and unfortunately uh 10 money is going to cost us two time instead of one but i think this is all going to work itself out because we have 11 spots available this will be three we have uh one action down here uh, to get to the training done which we get us to four uh realistically it's probably going to be about three actions to get this building down which gets us up to seven we still have four left over in order to get both of the cards played and it's possible that we uh, might run out of spots and we have to do a double hourglass. And at this point, it's worth noting that at the end of the game, there is going to be some negative points for any hourglasses that are left over on our tableau. And we see it's minus two points for one and minus four points for two. But if we're able to grab this uh, Hanging Gardens right here, we will get five points, which is half, uh, which is more than negative four, which I think is our worst case scenario. So uh, in the worst case, if we do these two, we end up getting a plus one victory point as opposed to just taking this one right here. So let's go ahead and action that plan and see if it works. So we'll take this uh, tile, we'll put it right here. Uh, we will need to put the two single hourglasses down like that, spend our 10 money, and then we get to grab both of these cards here. Everything is going to slide down, and there are no more cards to actually fill in the spot over there. So that is going to complete our first turn, and now we definitely have a plan for the rest of this round. It's now the green player's turn, and they've decided to do a Chronicler action, and they're going to spend three money and one time to do it. It looks like they were at ten money, so now they go down to seven, and they are going to get this uh, Zeus statue constructed. So they definitely have a um, oracle going already out on the map. And down, when we look down here, we see that they have uh, four priests. They definitely have the two merchants. And lastly, they need three of the nobles, but they only have two. And I think for the first time in the game, they are going to consume one of these temples to get them a temporary plus one wild on to the nobles to satisfy that requirement. This is now gone, and they can now uh, play this card. It looks like it has a bonus of giving them another priest. They're really, really far on those. And they can then add this into their tableau. There are, of course, no extra symbols because it's an era three card, but that's going to be worth 12 victory points for them. And they are now the first person to get eight cards constructed. So they just grab this token right now and immediately score the eight victory points for it. So that's going to be 12 plus eight or 20 points for playing this card down. They were at 54, and now they're all the way up at 74, and we are definitely feeling like we are falling behind at this point. But we have quite a bit of points in our cards to try and leap back up. Next up, Blue gets to go, and they are also going to do a Chronicler action. This is going to cost them four of their money and one of the hourglasses. And now they're going to go ahead and get this aqueduct built. We look down here and see that they do have the uh, two uh, artisans. They have exactly the four merchants needed and more than enough of the scholars to get this done. There's no uh, direct bonuses immediately for playing the card. Beyond, of course, the 11 points printed on it. So they go from 67 up to 78. Alrighty, it's now come back to us, and I see no reason not to continue with the plan I talked about in the first turn. So let's go ahead and activate this down here, allowing us to do a Philosopher action. Using this ability, we can spend as much money as we want, and that will, of course, cost one time. We know that we want a Noble and a Priest, so that is going to cost us seven money, and then we can go ahead and reset this row. Seven money brings us down to just five, but now when we take our noble and our priest, we know that we are well set up to try and complete all of the cards that we have in our hand. Next up, we once again have the green player, and they're going to do a chronicler action, which is starting to make us feel a little bit nervous, considering we want to play two of our cards still, and there's only three of these left. Uh, but anyway, this is the one they're grabbing. It has no cost in money when they put that down, and now they're going to go ahead and get this uh, public bath built. So when we look down here, we see that they need the two nobles. They also need uh, four of these um, uh, artisans, and they only have three. So they're going to discard one of these cubes to make up for the lack. 
And then down here, it looks like they're going to discard one more of these cubes to make up for missing one of these uh, scholars down here. Uh, next up, the uh, penalty for this card is they're actually going to lose a scholar, but then they can add this into their tableau which is going to give them 14 more points. Man, the green player is just dominating with these card scorings. They were at 74, and now they go all the way up to 88. At this point, it's now the blue player's turn, and they've decided to go navigating, and they're going to go ahead and do it over into an oracle spot. When they put it down into the area, they've decided just to do the two singles. Uh, they contemplated trying to maybe get another one of these buildings out, but it just didn't work out, uh, considering they're also hoping to spend some money and get some points at the end of the round. So this costs them four. They'll get rid of their ten, take six back, and then go ahead and place this out onto an Oracle location. At this point, it's no surprise. They come down here to the yellow area. They'll put it in uh, now Kratis, and then they activate yellow. That's going to give themselves two points and then two of these Oracle cubes. So they go from 78 to 80. And it's worth noting that for every two cubes you have mixed between your Oracle spot and your Temple spot, you will also get a victory point when the game is over. So if they don't spend these, that's another point in the bank for them. Okay, it's now our turn. There are only three Chronicle spots left, and we want two of them, so let's definitely jump on it and try to get this palace built. Our only options involve two times, so we may as well take the cheapest one. Fortunately for us, cheap means free, although we do have five money available to ourselves. And with that, we can now get the palace built. So that is going to generate one soldier for ourselves. And then when we tuck this in, it'll give us 13 points. Well, we're currently at 47, so that's going to bring us up to uh, 60 exactly. So fortunately, we didn't get lapped, I suppose. Uh, but we are still quite a far uh, bit behind our opponents. But that'll change if we get that 18-point uh, assembly built out on our next turn. It's now the green player's turn, and before they take their main action, they're going to use both of their oracle cubes. The first one they're going to use to go back 1-2 with their priests, and then 1-2 forward with their scholars. And with the second one, they're going to reduce the priests by 1, and their artisans by 1 to go up 1-2 again with their scholars. Next, they've decided to come back to the chronicler, which is getting very dry on these action tokens, and they're going to grab this one. And it looks like, unfortunately for us, they were able to get all three of those cards built. I didn't think they'd be able to pull that one off, but they're going to put this down here, and they're going to use a double hourglass instead of two singles in order to pull this one off. And then they're going to get this music school built. We see that they have the uh, two nobles they need, they have the two priests, they have the four scholars, they definitely have the three merchants, and the one artisan. So they don't even need to spend this last cube over here. They, of course, then slide this into their ridiculously large tableau and get 14 more victory points for it. At this point, I just don't see a way that we're going to be able to catch up to the green player. So they were at 88, and this is going to now bring them all the way up to 102. They've once again uh, nipping at our heels to lap us. That's not looking good. With their turn done, it's now the blue player's turn. They're going to do their usual uh, bonkers taxation thing. <laughs> they're going to go ahead and put this down right here. I guess it's going to be half the uh, usual craziness because they're only using one hourglass, so it's four times two or eight, which then gets doubled by their well as usual to give them 16 more money. Okay, we now get to take our turn, and we've got four action spots available to ourselves. Uh, green only has one, and blue is done, and I think let's go ahead and get this assembly built. Fortunately for us, there's just barely enough of these Chronicler tokens left over to make this happen. That is going to cost us one money, and we will have to use a double hourglass in order to also get this last building out on our next turn. So we go ahead and spend the money. We have four left over, which is exactly what we'll need in order to get this building built out. So that worked out pretty nicely for ourselves. And now let's go ahead and evaluate the assembly. Uh, it, when we look out here, we see that we uh, do have the three nobles. We have the three soldiers. We've got the four uh, priests. We have, let's see, uh, a virtual person for all three of these. So we effectively have three artisans and three merchants and two of these scholars. So we don't have to spend this cube in order to do this. Uh, we get to play this down. And unfortunately, it is going to make us lose a noble and a priest. Uh, if we look at it, we were just two away from being able to match all these up and then try to grab this one uh, before the green player does it, because it looks like they're probably going to do it on their next turn. But we just did not have enough uh, time to really get this done. And uh, playing this card is pretty good for ourselves anyway. It's, it's a shame we got so close but aren't able to pull this off. But let's go ahead and evaluate this, pulling this one down and this one down. Next, we can add this into our tableau, and that is going to be 18 points for us, but this is also our 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8th card. And the green player was able to get to 8 first, so they got the 8 points for it. 
but every other player who gets there will also get four points instead. So still pretty good for us. That's 18 plus four or 22 points for playing that card down. We were at 60, so now we can jump all the way up to 82. With our turn done, play now goes to the green player. They have one hourglass spot left over to themselves, and they're going to go ahead and activate this, which is going to allow them to do a purchase of up to four power from the market. When we look over here, we see that four will allow them to buy uh, two from these two down here, or one from everything, but again, green has that permanent plus one when they train from the market, so they're going to go ahead and activate all the way out to here, and they're going to target the uh, noble right there. They, of course, have to pay their hourglass as well as the four money to do this, and then they're going to get those two activations on the noble, bringing them from three to four, and now all of their tokens are touching, which means they are at exactly 18 people. They are the first and only person who's going to pull this one off, so they get this objective right here and eight more points. Considering they were at 102, this brings them to a nice even 110. With that, their turn is over, and they pass to the blue player, who is also done, so it comes back to us. And in fact, we're the only ones with actions left over, so let's now go ahead and get this final building built for ourselves. When we look out to the map, we know we want to activate the red region over here, so let's go ahead and do it for temples. And uh, we only have the two slots left, so we can't even do the free version, there's just no way to fit that in. So we're going to take this one right here. This goes onto our board with a, another double hourglass, so that's going to be two of them for ourselves, and we spend all of our money, but now we get this built out onto a temple spot. We are, of course, going to pick Athenia, or Athens, I suppose, and now that means we get to uh, activate the entire red region, so we're going to get two of these temple cubes, we are going to get two points, and we're going to get five more money. Well, two points brings us to 84, and this means we have five money total and three of these temple cubes. At this point, it also means that we are the first and only, in this case, person to get all six of our buildings out. So that's going to get us eight more points right now, which will bring us up to 92. And I just realized we forgot to refresh this market over here, but I don't think that really mattered. With that done, we are finished with our action. And in fact, everybody is completely full up on their action spots. So the heyday phase is over for the sixth round, and we can now go into the final decline phase. Nobody took the uh, starting player token, so that'll, uh, this will just stay right here. And now we can go ahead and clean everything off. But realistically, the only thing that matters is registering how many of the uh, double hourglasses turn into singles because of the uh, penalty that I mentioned earlier on. Next, we would advance this marker, but we can't, which just proves that we are now in the final uh, decline phase of the game, and we'll go into endgame scoring once uh, this decline phase is over. So now we can go ahead and activate all of our cities, and we will go first. We're going to get five money for this, five money for that, and uh, right now we have five money in hand. So that brings us up to 15, and if we activated this one over here, that would get us to 20, and uh, for every 10 money we have, we get one point. But I think it makes a lot more sense just to activate this one right here and get two points straight up. So that's 10 money and 2 points. This brings us to 94 and 15 total money. Next up, the green player will get uh, 1 oracle cube and 1 temple cube, which is essentially going to be 1 extra victory point for them in the end because, as I mentioned before, every 2 of these cubes mixed together is going to be 1 point. And finally, the blue player will get 2 points for this one, and it's an easy choice down here. They're going to activate this one to get 2 points as well, which bumps them up to 84. Next up, each player will activate their decline abilities. Uh, the green player still just has the two money for each merchant they have. I think they've had that maxed out pretty much every turn of the game. So that is going to be 12 more money for them. And it looks like that's going to essentially turn into one extra point for them at the end. And now the blue player will once again use this. They will spend all 15. So I guess they ended up with seven left over, which isn't super efficient on their part. But this 15 money will turn into five more victory points for them. So they go from 84 to 89. The last thing we check is hand limit. Uh, looks like nobody is over three cards. That'd be really bad at this point because uh, the hourglasses on our timelines uh, equal negative points for us. And so with that, the decline phase is now officially over and we can now move into end game scoring. Now the first end game scoring is just evaluating the cards that we have in our hand and trying to get uh, half of the points or of course losing half points if we don't uh, aren't eligible for it. And the one card that we have says we need two soldiers, which we do have. We need one priest, which we do have, and then we need five of the artisans. Now we have two plus our uh, phantom one over here, so that's three. So that means we can just discard two of these cubes from our temple area to make up for this. You're still allowed to use these even in the end game phase, and that is going to give us half points on this card. We don't play this card down here, uh, but that's going to give us five points total. So we go from 94 up to 99. 
we can now move on and see that the green player has no cards in their hand at the end of the game, and the blue player, unfortunately, still has these two Era 1 cards. That just they did not work out for them. They took these a long time ago and never really got around to getting them played again. Um, probably was a bit of a mistake, but either way, when we look at these, we can see that for this one, they certainly have the one and the two. Uh, it is worth one point, and you round up in this case, so they will get one point for this card right here. And then this one right here, um, they don't have the soldiers to make this work, but that's fine because it's zero divided by two rounded up, which is zero uh, negative points. So they're going to get just one bonus point for their cards which brings them up to 90. Next up with endgame scoring, we each get one point for every 10 money we have. Uh, we have 15, so that's one point total. The green player has 15, so they also get a point. And unfortunately, the blue player only has seven, so they're not going to get that point. This is going to jump us up to 99 points now, and the green player goes up to 101. Next, we can cash out our unused cubes for victory points. We only have one, and it's a rate of two to one, so we're not going to get any points for that. The green player has three, so they can discard these to get one point, and the blue player has two, so they will also get a point. Which brings blue up to 91 and green up to 112. We've now reached the final endgame scoring, and in this case, it is a negative scoring. So if you remember down here, you're going to lose points for the number of the uh, tiles still on the tracks. Uh, for one tile, you will lose two points, so it looks like green and blue will both lose two points. And unfortunately, for two tiles, that is going to be four points, so we're going to lose four with this. So green goes back down to 110. Uh, we are going to go down to 95, and blue is going to go down to uh, 89. And with that, we have finished all of the endgame scoring. Uh, it looks like the green player had a pretty decisive win with 110 to our 95. That's 15 points above. And then blue player, who was looking really good in the mid-game, kind of stalled out there and ends up in third place at 89. And that completes one full game of Gentis. Well, I hope you enjoyed this playthrough. Even though it was not super close there at the end, I think it was a pretty good example of how the game plays, specifically showing off a couple different strategies that I was trying to pull off with the different players. Uh, as far as uh, we were concerned, I was trying to uh, unlock as many of the actions as possible early in the game. Now, I didn't get all of them done, and I, I could have maybe gone pedal to the metal a little bit more with that, but at the same time, I had to try and do other things, and it seemed like about in the middle point of the game, I realized that we were going to be the ones that was going to go hardest on getting all those cities down and trying to synergize up and do really well with those. And I think that we had some pretty good things going on there, but I do think some strategic missteps happened with me in particular. You know, that uh, one of those early cards we got allowed us to, uh, for one action, do a philosopher action. And I think it was probably a misstep for us to not try to get a card that allowed us to get plus one philosopher action when we do that, or you know, not even with the cards. We could have done a, a city in town that would have given us that bonus. And it does mean we would have made less money income if we had done that instead of building out onto the map to get all that money. But if we had done that, we would have had a lot more people, which means it would have been uh, easier for us to play more cards, compete with the green player uh, for those uh, objectives, specifically with having all 18 people and getting eight cards down at the same time. And so I think I probably should have um, tried to focus on doubling down on an advantage I already had and just make that advantage much better because when it comes to the green player, they had that ability right from the start of having plus one philosopher action. And they never actually um, got around to getting a cheap version of doing the philosopher action until the later part of the game when they did that um, in town uh, building. And I think that really paid off for them. In fact, maybe they won the game because they played that, um, that town there. It was just two uh, times that they used it, but both of those times allowed them to really fill that area in. And I guess if they had not completely filled that in, they would have had eight less points, bringing them to 102. So they, they wouldn't have lost the game there, but it was certainly a very strong thing for them to do. And the focus of the green player was to try and really manipulate those uh, cubes, the oracle and the temple cubes, so that um, they they tried to obviously get a lot of people into their area, but they uh, didn't have to puzzle things out quite as much when they could keep throwing away these oracle cubes and just shifting people around like crazy. It was obviously very powerful, and I think another reason why the green player ended up winning. And, and the green player won by 14 points which is the number of points they got for that last card they played. So they effectively won by a card, which is a sizable number of actions when you consider the fact that you have to spend time to get cards and then, of course, time to play those things down. Um, so it was definitely a handy win by the green player, and I think the strategy uh, proved to be the best, at least in this playthrough. And then lastly, we had the blue player. It really seemed like they had a good thing going. You know, they went uh, hard on those cities that generated victory points every single turn for them. And then they had a really great two-card combo uh, for the first many turns of the game where they could just get tons of money for very few actions. 
and then dump that uh, 15 money into uh, five victory points. They did that five times throughout the game. So that was 25 of their 90 or so points. I can't remember exactly, but uh, that was a big part of it. And I think they probably got another um, uh, 15 or so from the cities out there. I'm, I'm not going to do the math right now, but either way, they, they had some really good stuff going, but they kind of ran out of gas when they got to the third era because the cards required so many people and those cards give you so many victory points. And so I feel like as a strategy, what the blue player did in the early phase of the game was probably good, but they should have pivoted a little bit more in the middle game as opposed to just doubling down on trying to stick with a thing that they had going because it didn't end up getting them uh, across the finish line, and obviously they came in third. So I think that wraps up all of my thoughts about this play. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel through Patreon, including all of these producer-level pledges. If you too would like to directly support the channel, you could do so at patreon.com slash Games, and I'd really appreciate it. Also, if you'd like to see more full game playthroughs like this one, as well as in-depth board game reviews and vlogs, please subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.